This video is supported by Brilliant. So recently I did a video on the Van Allen belts and specifically how NASA avoided going through them in the Apollo missions. It's a pretty great video. If you haven't seen it, I suggest check it out. I'll link it right here. Go check it out. NASA. The details of how they did it obviously are in that video, but basically they, they kind of navigated a course around the worst parts. Uh, kind of like an old school navigator charting a path through rocks. Except the rocks are, you know, intense beams of high energy particles. So there are two main donut shaped belts that make up the Van Allen belts, both of which could be deadly to astronauts if they spent a lot of time there, which of course they don't. It is something that they have to keep in mind though. Uh, I'm sure it's a bit of an annoyance to flight planners, but hey, the belts are because of the Earth's magnetic field, which is what makes all the life on this planet possible basically. Because without it, we would be constantly bombarded by high energy particles from the sun. So it's worth a few belts, I guess. But the field isn't perfect. In fact, it uh, kind of has a giant hole in it. Humans have known about the geomagnetic field for at least 2,400 years, with compasses and navigational equipment making use of it. But it was only mapped for the first time in 1701 by Sir Edmund Halley, the comet guy. To make this map, Halley sailed the Atlantic for nearly two years and collected observations from 170 locations. These days, of course, scientists make their maps using complex instruments both on the ground and in space. But they do have to be a little bit more careful about the space-based observations. Because there is one region of Earth's magnetic field that's particularly dangerous for satellites. It's the spot where the magnetic field is weak for some reason, and it's had consequences since the very beginning of the space age. And it's known as the South Atlantic Anomaly. The oldest detection of the South Atlantic Anomaly that I was able to find anyway comes from August of 1960. A team of scientists from the Lebedev Institute of Physics in Moscow noted, quote, an intense charged particle flux at 300 kilometers over the southern Atlantic Ocean. And the satellite that measured this flux counted 100 times more particle collisions than in regions outside of it. So it picked this up at 300 kilometers above the Earth, and um, it shouldn't be registering high level particle acceleration like that at 300 kilometers because most of the Van Allen belts start at about 600 kilometers. So why is the South Atlantic anomaly an exception? Because for some reason the strength of the magnetic field just goes down right here for some reason. It bottoms out at around 22,000 nanoteslas. That's about half what it should be. And this weaker geomagnetism just means that these high energy particles can get closer to the earth before they're deflected. And a weaker field means a lower Van Allen belt. Since it was first detected that time in 1960 at 300 kilometers, it's actually been detected as low as 200 kilometers. Now you might be wondering if this spot is more dangerous for humans, and the answer is, yeah, it is. But thankfully humans don't go through there very often. More on that in a minute. What does go through there, kind of a lot, are satellites. And this is a problem. Communication in scientific satellites can be affected here and happen quite a bit, most commonly by single event upsets or SEUs. An SEU is when an energetic particle interacts with a system's computer, uh, which can cause a discharge in the computer memory. For us non-computer scientists, this basically just means that a small bit of information in the computer is lost. And just to get ever so slightly in the weeds here, uh, computers store memory as bits, that's ones and zeros. And in our computers, these bits are used to represent documents, videos, anything else you might say there, but in a satellite, it might be used as part of the instruction for how to relay a TV signal or how to burn fuel to stay at the right height. So you can see why losing a bit of that memory uh, would be a problem for a satellite, not just in, you know, keeping it operating correctly, but just staying in orbit. But this is a known problem, so some manufacturers add shielding to protect against SEUs, but this can get expensive and adds weight. So more often than not, satellites that pass through the SAA have to compensate for these in other ways. So depending on the satellite's mission, some of this might involve, you know, checking data against a backup. Sometimes whole backup systems are built into a satellite. Other times all that's necessary is just a little common sense. Like take Landsat. Uh, this is a mapping satellite that's operated by the US Geological Survey. Uh, sometimes it might occasionally show bright white spots on its photos and then sometimes followed immediately by a dark spot. The white spot means that a particle oversaturated the camera's detector. Uh, the dark spot that follows is when the detector sort of recovers from that. But the Landsat operators know this, so they know they can discard the affected part of the image. By the way, here's a map of where Landsat SEUs have occurred. That big blob of red and yellow dots, that's the South Atlantic Anomaly. Another strategy is just to power down sensitive equipment. The Hubble does this actually. Uh, several of its cameras are usually powered down when it passes over the SAA, and it spends about 15% of its time passing over the SAA. And the pictures from the cameras that stay on are often affected by little blips like they have on Landsat. But again, operators expect this, so they consider it a small price to pay for extra uptime. In fact, they're a steal compared to some of the problems that the SAA has had with some of the other satellites. In 2016, Japan's space agency JAXA lost a $270 million X-ray telescope called Hitomi. 
probably because of the SAA. An SEU, or something like it, made the satellite lose orientation, and then when it tried to rotate back into its position, it kind of spun out of control and just ripped itself to pieces. I should mention here that this is an extreme case. Most satellites that pass through the SAA, they go through just fine, and when they do have anomalies, it's usually just a little thing. Um, it's not like this is the Bermuda Triangle or something. Although, I covered the Bermuda Triangle, and I showed that it's actually not any more dangerous than any other part of the ocean, so maybe this is like the Bermuda Triangle. This is actually slightly more dangerous, so maybe this is more of a Bermuda Triangle than the actual Bermuda Triangle. Oh no, I've fallen down a logic spiral. Which is the Bermuda Triangle of sanity. Anyway, satellites are one thing, but uh, what about people? What about people who go through the anomaly? Because they do, quite often. In fact, the International Space Station passes over it three or four times a day. The ISS orbits between 330 and 435 kilometers, so it does dip into the inner Van Allen belt, but only a little. And it's fast, so it only goes through the SAA for like three to five minutes at a time. But still, the space station is exposed to higher levels of radiation during this time. So the hull provides some level of protection for the astronauts and equipment. The water and stored in racks around the walls provide even more. Water is actually a better blocker of radiation than most metal. Uh, it contains more particle blocking nuclei. But still, long-term studies show that ISS astronauts receive about 0.3 sieverts per year of radiation, and that's about 60 times more than the average dose a person would receive here on Earth. Well shy of a fatal dose, but still significant. Even mild radiation exposure over time can increase the likelihood of cancer. Standards at NASA allow for increasing that risk by no more than 3% over their career. And to this day, no ISS astronaut has reached that limit, and so far none have shown any evidence of radiation having had any dramatic effect on their health. But they have made some interesting observations. And by that I mean, uh, sometimes they see things. You've probably heard of some of the strange flashes that astronauts see when they're in space. These are thought to be because of high energy particles literally shooting through their eyes. They were first observed on Skylab back in 1974, but they're especially common during flyovers of the SAA. Don Pettit, inventor of the Zero-G coffee cup, described his experience with SAA flashes in a 2012 blog entry as this. As we pass through this region, eye flashes will increase from one to two every 10 minutes to several per minute. I don't know about you, but I'm paranoid enough that that would freak me the hell out. But why? Why is this here? What, what is causing this? Before I answer, uh, let's go back to Edmund Halley for a minute. To make his map of the magnetic field lines, the famous stargazer took three different measurements. Latitude, longitude relative to London, and magnetic declination. That last one's the kicker. Simply put, magnetic declination is the difference between true north and magnetic north. It's also known as compass variation because it's kind of the difference in angle between magnetic north and north on the map. And if you're hearing that and you're confused because you thought that that angle should be zero, well, don't feel bad, most people do. But in fact, the magnetic north right now anyway is about 9.41 degrees from the rotational axis. Interestingly, I talked about this just a little bit in my Bermuda Triangle video. It's one of the explanations for that. So see, it, it all comes back around. By the way, you might see different numbers online. That's because it does actually move quite a bit. It can actually move up to 55 kilometers a year. So if you can imagine the magnetic axis were like a simple bar magnet, it wouldn't lie dead center in the middle of the Earth. It would actually have to be several hundred kilometers off center. Also, magnetic north is technically a magnetic south pole, but I think we're confused enough. Point is, there are several different theories to explain why there's this difference in the angle. The most acceptable one has to do with how the geomagnetic field is generated. Earth's inner core is thought to be a sphere of solid iron, or at least it used to be. Recent models suggest it may be a mix of materials in what they call a super ionic state. This solid or semi-solid inner core has a diameter of about 2,400 kilometers. Surrounding that is a thick outer core, 2,200 kilometers thick. This is thought to be mostly liquid iron and nickel. And it's the movement of that liquid outer core that generates most of the Earth's magnetic field. But it's not the perfect sphere that it's usually depicted as. No, it's lumpy and bumpy. Don't make a your mom joke. Don't make a your mom joke. Don't make a your mom joke. And because of that, the magnetic field that it produces is lumpy and bumpy as well, meaning different intensities of field strength in different places. And the SAA is one of those places, specifically an area of low strength, possibly due to a, a notable bump. And we have made maps of the core using uh, seismic data that do show two large blobs deep below the SAA, so there you go. Now, an interesting theory that came out just last year in 2021 is that those particular blobs might have been caused by the Theia collision 4.5 billion years ago. Now, the Theia impact is also thought to be what, you know, stirred up the core and gave us that strong magnetic field in the first place. But the theory is that pieces of Theia got embedded in the core, causing these lumps that create the anomaly. Now, there are some problems with this theory, particularly that there are also some blobs in the Pacific 
um, but there doesn't seem to be a Northern Pacific anomaly. Now this is still very much up for debate, but it's an interesting thought that, you know, we have satellites getting slapped out of space today by what's essentially the ghost of a dead planet. Sleep tight, kids. And one last thing to mention, I talked a second ago about how uh, the magnetic field is shifting quite a bit. Well, it's also getting weaker. Measurements from 1850 onward indicate that it might completely decay in 1300 years. Doom and gloom. Yeah, the study of magnetic traces in ancient minerals indicates that over time, the geomagnetic field can reverse. North can become south, up becomes down, humans sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Yes, the poles do flip from time to time. In fact, it's happened 183 times over the last 83 million years. So it's possible that this current weakening of the magnetic field means that we're heading for another reversal. You might have heard about this in some clickbait headlines. This is conjecture, though. Because despite the weakening trend, the field is still quite a bit stronger compared to some of the values it's had over the last 50,000 years. But this weakening has led to some changes in the South Atlantic anomaly. In fact, it's been growing for the last 50 years. It also appears to be splitting in two, creating an eastern and a western lobe. But NASA and other space agencies are keeping a close eye on it. Uh, there's whole fleets of satellites monitoring the SAA and the geomagnetic field overall. And while there have been surprises along the way, it seems to be more dynamic than they thought it would be, there's no real cause for alarm. Despite what you might have read, a sudden geomagnetic flip is unlikely. And losing the field completely is more unlikely still. The archaeological record shows countless changes and many reversals in the geomagnetic field. But through it all, life has found a way. And if some of this magnetic field talk caught you on your heels a little bit and you want to get a better handle on it, a good place to start might be the Electricity and Magnetism course on Brilliant. Learn about Maxwell's field equations, as well as Coulomb's law, Faraday's law, Gauss's law. There's a lot of laws, but don't worry, this isn't a legal course. Brilliant teaches you with exclusive animations and interactive puzzles that make it all simple and more important, fun. And that's what's great about Brilliant. It's a, it's a different kind of learning platform. Brilliant uses visual and interactive lessons to teach you by solving problems, which is something that we all know how to do on, on a certain level. It kind of hacks this innate problem-solving ability that we all have and uses it to teach fundamental concepts that you can then build upon and until the next thing you know you're using advanced math and science that you always thought was way out of your reach. It's a great gift for kids who are struggling to learn in the traditional school setting or if you're an adult and you just always wished you had a better handle on this kind of stuff, here's your chance. It's never too late. So if you've been on the fence about Brilliant, you can try the first few lessons of any of their courses for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. And if you like it and you want to know more, you can sign up for their premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses and get 20% off. This does only apply to the first 200 people who sign up, so don't wait too long. But anyway, Brilliant's great. I've been working with them for years. They've been huge supporters of this channel and uh, I always uh, enjoy going on there. And I think you will too. Anyways, brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down below. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are forming an awesome community, being really cool people, helping out in various ways, researching and whatnot. I, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, there's some new people that signed up. Let me murder their names real quick. We got Nigel Davenport, Jonathan Hickman, David Haley, Ryan Hudson, Adam Lank, KJS, Mary Fortney, Lucio, Chloe Taylor, Brian Hage, Hage, uh, Jeff Mil Milnerick, uh, Brindiana, George Daywood, Thomas Biddecoffer, and David Foster. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos and access to a really amazing group of people, uh, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check this one out because Google thinks you might like that one or any of the others on the side over, over here that have my face on them. I invite you to go check them out. And if you like them, um, subscribe. Go ahead and subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday. All right, cool. That's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.